Thanks, Zane, and hello to everybody who's tuned in. Great to meet you, virtually speaking. And uh, I recognise a few names from last week, so well done. You're back again. Um, as we said, feel free to use the, the chat area as we go along in your little blue control panel or console. As Zane mentioned, that the mutes are mic'd for the minute. It's just a bit chaotic with uh, quite a number of us in here virtually if we're all making noise at the same time. But uh, definitely... Time, uh, time ought to be on our side, and uh, you know, before we're done, if need be, you can raise your hand, and uh, we will unmute mics at the end if you do really want and need to speak. Um, but yeah, feel free to comment, ask questions, we go along, and we'll incorporate that as appropriate. Just in terms of where we're heading in the next uh, three quarters of an hour or so, um, if and when your organisation decides on a particular learning management system or LMS, you'll need to consider the look and feel. And that includes effective course design and how the users will interact with the system. So I guess the, the main purpose of this session this afternoon uh, is to tackle those five aspects there. As far as appearance is concerned, we'll look at the theming. Uh, and how best to represent your school's brand. In terms of navigation, uh, we'll look at key elements such as breadcrumbs, menus and blocks. Accessibility wise, um, it would be remiss of us to simply um, choose the look and feel of a, an LMS on the basis of desktop or laptop computers. Uh, naturally there's a lot of us using mobile and, and tablet devices. As far as personalization is concerned, We'll, uh, we'll have a look at and we'll consider user profiles, things called dashboards, and how we can customise the system for individuals. And lastly, structure. We'll get into uh, perhaps what a, an online course might look like and look at settings, formats, and layouts. So, Ian, it might be a good time to push that poll out and uh, we'll get our attendees thinking from the get-go. Um, as far as what might be the top priority for your school as far as the learning management system is concerned. So we'll, uh, we'll see on screen in a short bit, um, I guess options, options that relate to appearance, navigation, accessibility, personalization and structure. Um, if you're not sure what your school's priority might be, perhaps have an educated guess. Now, Ian, are we able to push that push that poll out? Okay, it's in progress. So I'll give you uh, perhaps a little little moment to take your pick. No worries. <laughs> you might have to feed those back to me, and me being in full screen presenter mode, I can't see the poll or the results. Okay. All right.
Well, that's good. That's a relief. Um, I guess in terms of colours, fonts and logos. But um, as we'll see in a short while, and, and we might be able to pay testament to, um, you know, our younger audience, they're pretty hung up on what the system looks like and, and may not be so hung up on how it actually works, contrary to what we what we think. Thanks for that, Ian, and, and thanks for those people who polled in. Look, with respect to appearance, um, as, as I've suggested, perhaps uh, to many users, particularly those uh, of the, you know, of the, uh, I guess, the teenage variety, as far as system acceptance is concerned, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a fair chance that what the LMS looks like is more important in their mind and their eyes than what it does. That's not to say the other things aren't important. I'm, I'm completely with you as far as interactivity and formatting and you know, compatibility for different sorts of devices is concerned. But um, four things, theme, colour, font and icon set as far as appearance are concerned. So let's have a look at those. So depending on the LMS you're using or you, you, you decide on um, a theme, or that language might vary somewhat. It might, uh, might also be referred to as a template or a skin or some sort of style. I think you get the idea. Um, the advent of cascading style sheets, or CSS, um, it's, it's a web programming language. It's allowed us to separate function and form, and by that I mean we're able to change the visual elements of a web page or a learning management system without editing the, the text or the content. Okay? Um, this, is, this is one such example. It could be a learning management system. We're in the administration configuration settings and uh, we would come in, there may be an array of themes or templates available, and we pick or choose the one that's most appropriate for our organisation. Uh, or alternatively, we could, we could design our own if we were quite savvy with CSS. As far as colour goes, well, I think it's fair to say we, we can accept that that's likely to be dictated by the colours of your school. Um, you know, as, as, as far as I see it, a simple rule of thumb with respect to fonts, or um, you know, I guess the the text font colour and the background contrast, um, light on or dark on light or light on dark works particularly well. So by that I mean perhaps a dark font on a light background, or a light font on a dark background. Bear in mind though, with the latter, if you use a dark background, that can be pretty harsh um, on the eyes after not too long, and it also uh, it'll chew up a fair bit of um, print toner in a hurry. Um, another thing to consider with, with colours as far as theming goes is, is colour blindness. It's, it's not as rare as we think. I, I was doing a little bit of a, a scoot around um, before the presentation and in Australia um, apparently 8% of the male population has some uh, form of colour blindness and about 0.4% of females. So that might mean that uh, as far as colour blindness is concerned, users may not be able to distinguish between the shades of either green and red or blue and yellow. So uh, something else for us to consider. And, and Ian's made a valid point there, just keeping half an eye on the chat, um, assuming we can print web pages. And that's not always uh, always possible. Again, it depends on, um, I guess, the functionality being inbuilt to the, either the website or the system or the, or the LMS. Um, and, and naturally, the, uh, the, de the said device being connected to a, to a printer or a network. Okay, I'll just I'll just forward through a few examples of some themes here for a for a typical learning management system, and and naturally the the colours, the fonts, the styling, the icons um, will vary somewhat. The general layout, the look and the feel, the contents the same. Bear that in mind, as I said, uh, we're able to separate function and form, or the design and the and the textual elements. So have a look at a few of these, and I'll get you to pick your favourite. I'll leave each of these up maybe for 10 seconds. Okay, I'll go back through those quickly and then I'm curious to know 
um, which of those themes, if I, I showed four of them, there's white, green, orange or blue, which was your favourite? If I just toggle back through them quickly from the first, so white, oops. green, orange or blue. So if you just want to drop a few words in the chat area in the next minute, feel free to do so in terms of your preferred theme and, and why. There's no right or wrong answer here, incidentally. They're all okay themes. And it's, it's certainly, as far as uh, you know, theme design is concerned, it's certainly in the, uh, the eye of the beholder. I'm with Ian. I'm a bit of an orange tragic as well. Facebook blue. Funny, that's a, an interesting point there. And then perhaps from a, from a again, a, a teenager's point of view, uh, that colour they can associate with, and suddenly the, the LMS is hip and cool like a social network. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, William and Russell. Thanks, Kelly. Kelly makes a good point about the green and navigation uh, and blocks on both sides. Ruchi uh, says blue, found it clear, didn't hurt their eyes. So I think the point I'm trying to make here is your preference has come through, and thank thank you uh, to those who are who are giving their two cents worth. There's no right or wrong answer, as I said, and you know if we've got four different options, uh, we're going to get four different responses. Um, you know, it is certainly in the eye of the beholder. No right or wrong answer there, but naturally we can see the different colours and styles and layouts. Naturally with any of these in the header or the top section of the theme, um, as far as good themes are, are concerned, um, you ought to be able to drop your school logo. Again, just to further kind of reinforce your brand and um, you know, and have that out there and, and keep your marketing people people happy. And and just again, I guess to kind of kind of um, to help identify your organization with the learning management system that should be very achievable with respect to fonts so that's the the, the textual content the, the type that we saw uh, on screen um, and need to consider um, as far as font goes more in particular the typeface there's really there's two types of typefaces and you may have heard of um, serif and sans serif. The, the idea being um, serif, serif um, fonts have semi-structural details kind of appended to the, the strokes that make up the letters of the numbers and the symbols. Um, apparently as far as font um, experts are concerned serif fonts give us better readability relative to sans serif and they're often used in traditional print media so books, newspapers, magazines and so forth. So your typical serif fonts include, and I've got them listed there, Courier, Georgia, Times New Roman. As far as sans serif goes, um, my French is pretty savvy, uh, shabby I, I should say, um, but I do know that sans, sans is without, so I guess sans serif is without the serif. Um, it gives us a cleaner appearance as far as the, the font typeface is concerned. But it does. The trade-off is that it does mean. Um, I guess it's a it's a font that's less readable in an offline sense. So you know, printed media being the you know the traditional example there. On the same token, the flip side being, um, sans serif um, is often heralded as having better readability on screen, and it's become the de facto standard, especially for online. Um, you know, sort of internet in particular. So you know, a learning management system is no exception to that. Um, you know, and examples there again listed include Arial, Helvetica, and Verdana. And we've got a few coming through. Pet Hate Ian's is Times New Roman. That's real old school, and it's, it's often a default. Um, you know, it's a default font typeface. Richard's Pet Hate font is Comic Sans. Oh, I must confess, Richard. I've you know probably like quite a few people go through uh, font phases. You know, different font. Every, uh, every term, semester, or calendar year. And I have, it was probably a decade ago, but I did have a Comic Sans phase or period. Um, I, I grew out of that, thankfully. Um, what are other, 
unless you're a comic. Thanks, Kelly. What are other people's preferred on-screen font and why? If you just want to drop that in the chat window, I'd be curious to know. Again, there's no right or wrong answer here, but what's your preferred font typeface? Personally, I kind of like Georgia, but um, you know I use it a lot, a lot online. But you know, uh, you know, strictly speaking, it's a serif font, and it's probably uh, best served in a in an offline or a you know traditional sense. Thank you, Calibri. Calibri uh, Verdana for San Serif from Richard Ariel. Ariel's very popular, so too is Verdana. Excellent. And some reasons coming through. Again, it is the look, the feel, it's easy to read. So I guess readability is the big thing. But as, as I indicated, the uh, the uh, the medium, you know, the medium in question can dictate um, if a serif or a sans serif font is uh, perhaps most appropriate. Thank you for that. Again, just something else for us to consider. And you're not, as far as theming goes, you're not stuck with a single font. You might use different styling for different types of elements. So, for example, you know, a heading, heading, uh, headings one, two, three, and four might be a serif font. But then, uh, you know, in in an online sense, you may use sans serif fonts for you know your paragraphs or your uh, your ordered and unordered lists. So you can have a combination. It's the best of both worlds. And, May keep uh, more people happy. With respect to icons and icon sets, you know, there's the, the old adage that a picture can tell a thousand words, and you know, with the advent of graphical user interfaces, we get our windows and menus and programs. We also get icons. So, you know, an icon being a small image served up as a system feature, an icon set. It's an extension that I guess it's simply a series of small images that represent features, system features. So the idea being that icons are quick and they're an intuitive representation of a function or feature within a system, in this case a learning management system. And more to the point, um, if the usability is very good, the icon should hyperlink to um, that particular feature or function. So it takes you somewhere. Um, as I said, icons form part of a GUI or a graphical user interface, as we know with Windows and Mac in particular. Um, those who are sort of less prone to command line um, appreciate icons and uh, GUIs. And more to the point, icons help us understand, um, they improve the, the use of a system and help us navigate it. So there's all sorts of benefits to um, you know, good iconography, if, if you can call it that. I'm not even sure if that's a word. It's all part of good system usability. So we've got three examples of icon sets there that might relate to a learning management system. Again, I'm interested in your thoughts. There's no right or wrong answer. But feel free to use the chat area. Um, what are your thoughts? What's your preferred icon set if we say we've got three on screen there, so one, two or three? Which do you prefer and, and perhaps a, a quick reason as to why? So feel free to drop something in the chat area there. There's a uh, chat area won't bite incidentally. Um, it's uh, no right or wrong answer. So people saying set one, easy to read and clear. Three, doesn't look busy, it's cleaner. Set one, most distinct and clean. Thanks, Ian. And Brett and Kim. Three, one. Very interesting. Interesting how some of us are referring to the icon set by colour, red or blue, where in fact that's the, uh, I guess, the, the colour of the, uh, the text, um, text to the right side of the icons. But one, two, three. 
So it is again. We've had, we've had three options, and we've had three different um, different responses there, um, expectedly. Um, Avsal makes a good point about option icon set three looking a bit jumbled together with icons. So if I read that cor correctly, uh, what Avsal means is that I guess the icon set doesn't flow doesn't seem consistent. It looks like a bit of a dog's breakfast. Um, but uh, perhaps in comparison, relatively speaking, icon set one or two has a bit more flow, let's call it, or consistency within the package of images. I think that's what you mean. Mac, hi Mac, I recognise your name and hope you're well. Um, it says that set two looks more familiar. And I think that's the idea that, um, you know, as I said, um, pictures can tell a thousand words, maybe not a thousand, but the idea would be if we took away the text, I guess they're sort of textual cues, like chats, choices, databases, feedback, forums, etc. Thanks, Ian. Um, would, we, would we understand um, what, um, what the icon meant, as in would the image um, in our minds represent a system or a feature or a function? Um, without the text. So that's kind of the aim of the ultimate icon set. Okay, um, so bear that in mind. And with um, a theme for your learning management system, um, you should have on offer um, a range of icon sets. So each theme um, may or may not use the standard icon set, it could well have its own. Okay. So bear that in mind, and it's, a, it's another part of good system usability that we need to appreciate. Navigation. Well, in a nutshell, this describes how users are able to move around or, or you know, find their way or you know, get from one place to another um, in a learning management system. So learners, um, or end users, I should say, more to the point, I might just pause there for a minute. I'm sorry, I've just seen a couple of things come through um, worth mentioning. Um, Afsal asking whether with the icons we need to have the written word. Well, um, if the icons are good enough, they should stand alone without the text, but you, you can't be sure. Um, and Ian makes a good point that uh, many of us are, are visual learners, okay? Certainly in an online um, situation. Um, it's far more effective and efficient to um, you know, display images in when you've got limited screen real estate in particular versus just a big dump of text. And people have less tolerance for, for text in an online context. But look, as far as, and thanks for those points, as far as navigation goes, um, users have two options um, when getting their way around the web, and in particular an LMS. They can either click or scroll. Um, breadcrumbs. Uh, we will have a look at in a short while. You might or might not be aware of or familiar with them. Menus, uh, you, you certainly um, you will be familiar with. And things called blocks, again, the language might change depending on uh, your LMS solution. But we'll look at each of these things in turn. As far as breadcrumbs are concerned, it's a funny thing. Um, you know, Hansel and Gretel, I, I guess the metaphor there is Hansel and, the Hansel and Gretel fairy tale. And, uh, you know, my, my recollection of fairy tales is a bit like my, my grasp of the French language. It's not that great. Um, but what I do know, something along the lines of Hansel and Gretel um, went out into the woods um, from the cabin and um, they, they scattered breadcrumbs along their path as they went so that uh, when they turned around to come back they would be able to find their way back to where they came from. So that's kind of the idea or the essence of breadcrumbs in an online sense except that um, breadcrumbs aren't about history, it's meant to be about hierarchy in terms of what page you're on um, in the context of the overall site or system. So if you haven't noticed here breadcrumbs are the, the single line of text at the top toward the top of the page and they show your location in the site or the system hierarchy. So you can see their home in the little arrow, and then courses, how to Moodle, general, news forum. Right, that's where we are now. 
Um, they are meant to improve usability. As a matter of fact, they're becoming increasingly popular as a, as a secondary navigation aid. Um, naturally, the, the primary navigation aid for most sites and systems on the web um, is a menu, be it a, a horizontal or a vertical menu. It's um, typically, typically textual. Um, it may be purely hypertext, or it might be, you know, it might be um, buttons, or it could be you know, CSS and sort of spill down menus or spill across menus. So that's breadcrumbs. As far as menus go, as I said, this is, this is typically your primary navigation function with sites and systems. You can see here hypertext um, that represents the site menu, uh, course topics, and if we were to further down this navigation or perhaps on another um, block altogether, it might contain administrative functions depending if we were an LMS administrator or a teacher editing an online course. Now, incidentally, um, this particular menu um, is expandable and collapsible. So you can see there um, within the navigation block, we've got courses and that expands out how to Moodle. And then we've got all of these sub-elements or items, participants, reports, general, and so forth. So we could click and turn any of those little arrows that would expand out again. And the reverse process without demonstrating it would be to click the arrow and it would collapse all of the sub-elements. So that's a fairly standard way to navigate a learning management system. So look out for breadcrumbs and menu um, navigation in your preferred LMS. As far as blocks are concerned, again, this is kind of part of the, I guess, the triumvirate with uh, respect to navigation. Um, are blocks. So blocks might go by different language for different LMSs. It could be modules or widgets or sidebars or something to that effect. They ought to contain um, contextually relevant information. So if the, uh, if the block is very clever, um, it knows who you are and where you are in the, uh, the system context. So are you on the front page or are you in a course index? or in a course in particular, or on the gradebook page, or your user profile page. And it will quite possibly serve up different elements on the menu as a result of who you are and where you are in the system. Um, as, as far as blocks are concerned, well, this one, this one as, a, as a case and example, uh, these can be moved. They can be moved up or down a page within the LMS. They can be moved up or down, left or right. Um, they can be hidden, they can be deleted, in fact they can be docked. Um, these two do uh, blocks have, as a matter of fact, been docked to the left side of the, a course page. You can see the navigation block and beneath it the settings block. So a good LMS should allow you to um, move your menus and more to the point your blocks um, around your pages. So up or down or across, so hide or delete them or to dock them like this to really declutter course page and and um, give give a, a lot more white space and as far as the web is concerned and, and good design I think white space is good you don't have enough of it people people tend to clutter pages um, and it can overwhelm our learners so there's a few things to bear in mind Now, for those who tuned in last week, uh, you would have seen these trends, and I won't I won't labour the point too greatly, except that it's kind of um, it's pertinent to, to where we're heading in a moment. Um, but look, Australian Bureau of Statistics and Nielsen Online um, tell us a couple of things about um, Australian internet activity of late, and it's important we understand these trends um, as educators if we're going to embrace new technologies for the purpose of uh, Good learning, online learning. So there's four, th four, I guess, key trends that come to mind, and if we sum them up, it's wireless, mobile, broadband, and tablet. So these things are popularising and becoming more commonplace. All right. So what that in turn means for us, and again, this pretty diagram. If you were if you were in attendance last week and you were awake, uh, you would have seen this as well. Um, this is what 
a good learning management system might look like. So the cloud represents the internet, the LMS is kind of the heartbeat of um, this particular diagram. So, you know, there's a multiplicity of communication and collaboration and assessment and reporting tools contained within a good LMS. And we as, we as users, administrators, teachers, learners, we connect to the learning management system via the internet using various devices. So it's anywhere, anytime learning by anyone about anything. And um, it's not simply desktops or laptop computers. We could be talking about, as I alluded to before, um, tablet devices or mobile phones. Okay, are becoming more commonplace, not just in um, households and workplaces, but as you would appreciate, being teachers um, in schools. Just perhaps a quick, uh, a quick indication in the in the chat area, if your school has either a some sort of, um, let's call it mobile initiative, either in place or in the pipeline. It could be for a tablet device like an iPad, or it could be um, a PDA or a mobile phone or, or something similar. Just indicate that quickly to us in a few words or less. Anybody? I'll just wait 10 more seconds in case somebody is typing or we'll move forward. And Fani makes a, a valid point, whether your school does or doesn't have um, some sort of technology initiative along the lines of let's say a, a notebook or a tablet program, um, a lot of students have access to these technologies in any case, whether they be by out of school or the moment um, they're at home they can They've got the internet on tap and they could be connecting to your learning management system via a tablet device or a smartphone. And Kim, uh, Kim echoes that sentiment. Thank you. And Richard likewise. And that's exactly right. That's the philosophy behind the learning management system. Um, that we're not bound by the timetable, you know, Monday to Friday, nine to three or thereabouts. It's anywhere, anytime learning. So learning without borders or boundaries, let's say, as long as you're connected to the internet and you've got a you've got a connecting device in a in a modern web browser. So to that end, we've got to uh, we've got to design good uh, online learning that uh, you know reflects this trend and this demand. And thanks, Oran, uh, makes a, a good point as well. Mobile for iPhone and iPad and Android, it's also available. And that's right, there's um, there's an app, an app, sadly, that Moodle HQ won't be supporting for much longer. I think it's just been too cumbersome um, in its current form anyway, it's sort of flash-based form um, for, for iPhone. Um, but having said that, there is now a default theme for, for Moodle that supports... Um, tablet and mobile devices and, the th and um, there's, a, there's a global configuration within Moodle LMS incidentally where you can, uh, you can enable device detection. So Moodle, the LMS becomes clever enough to know uh, what device the end user is trying to connect to it with and serves up a, an appropriate theme. And um, Afsal is just asking eh, in terms of what version um, of Moodle is being used in schools. Well, it, it could be a multiplicity. If there's anyone, um, you know, if you want to drop that in the chat window as we go along, feel free to do so. You might be using Moodle 1.9, as a lot of schools are. Schools are um, perhaps um, you know a few iterations, software iterations behind, and that's that's understandable. Uh, Moodle is now at um, the latest stable release is 2.3.1. So um, if, if you want to tap into um, Moodle's mobile capability, um, I think you've got to be using at least Moodle 2.1, 2.3. Um, naturally, other learning management systems, um, let's not just speak Moodle, but other, other LMSs, um, good LMSs should support um, a multiplicity of devices. 
not just desktop and laptop, but mobile and tablet as well. So look out for that if you're in the evaluation phase. So this is it. This is all about accessibility. Accessibility can mean a lot of different things to different people in, in various contexts uh, for what we're on about. Um, it is all about designing online learning um, with consideration for these different device types that users um, might have access to. Right. So as I said, a desktop, that could be the computer at your desk, it could be the laptop that um, you take with you when you're not at your desk, or, or even a thin client, I suppose, falls into that category. Mobile, we're talking about smartphones, web-enabled phones, such as iPhones and um, Androids, and tablet devices, iPads, and maybe the iPad killer, Samsung, and you know the, uh, the, other, and the, uh, the other options there in the tablet market. Netbooks, netbooks fit there somewhere as well. Not sure if um, netbooks were just a bit of a passing fad. But look at this. Um, this is a screenshot of what an online course might look like in a, in a typical learning management system. We've got you know, the header at the top. You can see that I'm logged in as yours truly. We've got navigation, horizontal navigation menu. We've got breadcrumbs beneath that. Then we've got, I guess, in the left two thirds of the page, we've kind of got the, the course content, activities and resources, thanks Anne. And on the right side, we've got the blocks and modules or widgets with things such as navigation and settings, settings relating to the course and the site or the system at large, globally speaking. So this, this screenshot shows a typical online course optimised for a desktop device. Okay, you've got a fair bit of resolution there with a bigger display, generally, be it from 13 to 15, maybe up to 25, 27 inch. Okay, so you can fit a fair bit of stuff, say for want of a better word, I guess, content, images, modules and so forth. If we fast forward, um, that's a, that's a screenshot on a mobile device in landscape, display. Not a lot of screen real estate, let's be honest. Okay, so this is the same course. Um, naturally, it's a, it's a touch screen. So we've got button navigation there at the top. Um, with, with the screen real estate being so limited, you know, the res you know, we're operating at such, such a small resolution, in fact, it looks as though we've only got a single column layout. Okay, so designers need to be really savvy for these uh, low resolution, um, you know, small screen devices to to uh, serve up an optimal um, user experience. So we've got to bear it in mind. Um, not all devices are created equal, and from my experience, you know, I've used learning management systems on laptops, desktops, netbooks, PDAs tablets, mobile phones, um, different experience with different devices, to be honest, um, and, and things like mobile phones and tablet devices perhaps better lend themselves to consumption than, uh, than authoring. So that's, that's something to bear in mind. Here's a few more screenshots. So I've just put together a series of screenshots here. This relates to... Um, Again, a, a typical learning management system as viewed from a tablet device, such as an iPad. Okay, you can see we've got um, a bit more screen real estate to work with than we than we saw back there for a smartphone, but um, but a bit less than what we had on the desktop display. Ains just made a point that I guess the draw. He says the drawback of a touch. Touch displays by its nature must use more space for navigation than a stylus driven device. Yeah, and that's a fair point. A fair point. I, I can think back to the days when I was using a PDA. Um, the stylus is nice. You can normally hit your target, and that target or hotspot doesn't have to be as big as a, a button uh, that on, on a, I guess, a touch display. But, but I guess the upside of um, smartphones and tablets and touch screens is that uh, there's nothing and Apple was onto a winner I reckon um, when it invented those devices 
Um, there's nothing more natural than a user using their hands or their fingers to navigate. You know, the moment you put a mouse or a keyboard or a stylus in the way, it's kind of another, you know, it's a it's an intermediary. It's a kind of a, a bridge or a barrier between the uh, the system and the user. But um, I, I I do get your point. Um, here's another screen. This is a uh, user. We can see it's a two-column layout. That settings uh, that settings button is is huge. It spans the width of, of the display. We're in uh, we're in portrait. Uh, pardon me, landscape mode. Incidentally, and the student on the left in the leftmost column there, we can see the student block has been expanded out. It kind of toggles. So I guess that's the language being used as far as this theme is concerned. And we can either um, we can toggle to have the uh, the second column visible or not. So it's a real monochrome sort of theme, I guess. And that's kind of the way with tablet and smartphone devices. Uh, perhaps resolutions um, may or may not be showing as many colours. In any case, with the mono monochrome sort of theme, you, you tend to get less less colours and, and sometimes duller themes. As you can see here, this is within um, the same course on a, on a tablet device, two column layout. We've kind of got the two, third, uh, two rightmost thirds of the page being dedicated to the, the topic and the content within this particular course. And all of the blocks, they're kind of um, collapsed on the left side there and they can be toggled to expand, uh, to be expanded. So uh, the same course, this is in portrait mode. So we lose a little bit of real estate, but again, still very workable. And this is a different um, navigation element, I guess, than you might get in a, on a desktop or a mobile device. Um, you may or may not see this, where we've just clicked a button and then this sort of menu expands out. And you can also see um, the other elements, both in the header and the footer, I guess the icons, but they're, also, they're more than purely the icons, they're kind of representing big buttons, hyper, hyper media that will take us to particular features or functions. Okay, so some food for thought. I might just go back one slide. Has anyone got um, any questions or comments with respect to um, perhaps theming for mobile or tablet devices or any experience there or stories they want to share with us before we move forward. What's worked, what hasn't, what your thoughts or feelings are. Ian's asked the question of Moodle, does it allow a layout that you've designed to be turned into a template for other users to create a new space, um, a la SharePoint? Um, in, in a sense it does. As far as the, 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 the theme is concerned, um, I guess that's the design element, so the colours, the fonts, um, the icon set. Um, that's something that can be forced globally, so every user gets the same look and feel in all courses, or it can be granularised at a uh, at a course level, or you can open it up so every user can choose their preferred theme for for the LMS if they prefer blue, green, or red, for example. Um, to answer what you're asking, I think you're asking Ian, as far as layouts are concerned, if in, as far as Moodle's concerned in a course. If you've got a, a layout that you like, so it's, this is independent of theming and colours and fonts and styles, but let's say the, the headings or where the blocks are positioned in a course or even some of the, the activities or resources contained in the course. If you back those up in Moodle, you can restore them as a new course and go from there. So I guess you can quickly template or clone your courses and reproduce them or replicate them very quickly. I'm glad that's what you meant. Um, in answer to your question, so yep, and I would look out for that in in uh, in any system. It's a bit separate, I guess, from theming. But any good LMS should allow you to quickly copy or clone a course 
um, and replicate it again. It's sort of the perennial thing I know for teachers in schools at the end of a semester or a calendar year. You've got a UBIT course in 2012 and you want to run a similar course for 2013 and you've garnered some feedback from your students, had a meeting um, with your colleagues, um, a depart departmental meeting and I guess made the resolution to what you're going to do for 2013 but the easiest thing as far as your online course um, is concerned to do would be to back it up strip away the learners um, and perhaps all of their forum posts and quiz attempts and you know assignment submissions and restore um, a copy of that course as you know as a, as a new version of it for 2013 so that can be done um, certainly in the case of Moodle AppSales just asked a question on the side there, perhaps for Ian or somebody else who's perhaps um, better versed with what SharePoint can do these days. Does it have a rep repository function or feature um, such as Moodle has? I'm just going to move forward as, uh, as uh, I'm mindful of time with about 10 minutes remaining. Okay, look, as far as personalization is concerned, it's got to be one of our key aims. It's to make uh, the learning management system uh, and the online learning component of our programs and curriculum and subjects as relevant to each and every learner as we possibly can. Fortunately, the good news is uh, to that end, uh, you know, with learning management systems, it's quite simple to eliminate that one size fits all approach. Uh, with, fe with features such as user profiles, dashboards, and the ability to customise or for individuals to customise um, their view of the learning management system. So we'll have a quick look at some of these things. This is an example of a user profile on a typical LMS. Um, you can see here a fair bit of information about this online user they are, where they're from, uh, perhaps a little biography, an avatar or a, a picture of them. This is their online persona if you like. Um, you can share your interests, perhaps courses you're enrolled in, even recent activity. And um, you know the online user profile is it's it's critical, it becomes gold and it's uh, it's it's very important in non-face-to-face situations where there's not a lot of personal contact and it's a very quick way to personalise the teaching and the learning and for people to get to know one another. I mean even in a face-to-face -face situation I've used user profiles countless times as a teacher in a school you know where you have those parent-teacher interviews um, very early in a term or a semester and you're still trying to put faces to names that sort of thing because we know it can get a bit embarrassing when you've, uh, you're you meeting a parent for the first time and you don't even know their, uh, their son or daughter's name. So a profile is important and it's really one click away for any course participant or system user. So it's a very easy way and effective way for you to tell other system users a bit about yourself and you know make a personal connection. Uh, you can see some other information at the top there too. This is, this is a particularly sophisticated uh, theme but under my name right at the top right there's a little um, there's a little arrow that allowed me to expand um, so we could see upcoming events and then things such as my courses, private files, calendar, mail and so forth. So some additional features that help personalise um, my view of the system. This dashboard here is something I would look for in any good learning management system. Okay, it's a, I guess a dashboard in essence is a single page that contains a snapshot um, from an end user's perspective. So in this case, um, you know, um, events, courses, activities, you know, things of a time relevant nature, even grades and instant messages, online users. Um, and importantly, um, we should well, there should be the capability that allows users to customize their dashboard. Okay, it's important. It, it empowers them and they can take co-ownership of the system, take co-ownership of their teaching and their learning space. So it's it's an easy buy-in 
if you've got a dashboard and the ability for individuals to customize their view of the system. Okay. Let's face it, with, uh, you know, with good systems, um, what people like about Facebook, I guess, as an example, um, it makes it so popular for, for a teenage audience is the fact that people can personalize it, customize it, call it their own, and they feel really connected to it. So in some, some kind of way, if we can, we can achieve that sort of sensation with an LMS, we're on a winner. Okay, lastly, course structure. So we as educators need to consider not only um, online course design, but also how we, we want our learners to engage with our courses. So it's all about settings, format, and layout. So these are the sort of settings in an online course you should have at your disposal if you're either an administrator or a course editor. So the name of the course, perhaps a summary, the format, the layout, how many weeks, how many topics, start, finish date and so forth. Okay, that's fairly stock standard. So if we run with the topics format, and a lot of, a lot of teachers and schools um, will use this sort of format, you'll, uh, when you've populated a course with activities, and resources, it might look a little bit like this. So you may have blocks on the left and the rightmost section of a course page. A course being much like a subject. For example, you might be a teacher of Year 10 English. And in the centre area, you have your topics. So I guess these are the, the themes or the, the key, the ideas that relate to your course of study. And they're kind of sections that appear top to bottom down, uh, down your course page. On the contrary, if you went with a weekly format, and I've seen teachers prefer this, um, if you're running a very termly or semesterized sort of program, you might commit to putting activities resources up on a weekly basis. And that gives um, not just you and your colleagues, but also your learners a bit of certainty in terms of where you're at and what comes next. You can see there the date. So for topic one or section one, you can see that goes from 1st July to 7th, Next section, 8th July to 14th, so on and so forth. Okay, and now that's a, it's a typical model adopted at university. Um, you know, you're in week 10 or 15, and registered training organisations, RTOs, tend to use this sort of approach as well, from, from my experience. The good news is we can eliminate that scroll of death um, that you can get from a weekly or topics format. As I said, users have two options navigating an online course they can either scroll or click. So we can get rid of that vertical scroll quite quickly if we set our course up to display one section per page, as you can see here. And then the learner um, has a fairly decluttered view of any um, discrete topic within the course of study at this point in time. And they can navigate back. They're in course design at the moment as the topic, but they can, back, you know, they can go back to essentials or they can go forward to communication and collaboration or they can return to the main course page. They've kind of got a, a truncated view of all the, uh, the topics or weeks or sections. All right, so we really want to try and eliminate that scroll of death. Um, as a matter of fact, um, usability studies tell us that um, people spend 80% of their time above the page fold. So by that we mean, I guess, the web page fold. If you've got more vertical content on a page than is in the initial page fold, it's often hidden from the from the user's initial view and they might miss it or disregard it or ignore it altogether. So this kind of sums it up. Um, this was a, it's all about, I guess, reading web content and let's face it, users read web page content very differently to content read via traditional media, such as books, newspapers, magazines. Now this is kind of, uh, I guess, a synopsis of a uh, a 2006 study conducted by a usability guru, a chap by the name of Jakob Nielsen. So he, it was a, a study uh, involving two, over 230 people. They looked at thousands of web pages. Um, and according to the results of the study, the dominant reading pattern for web pages resembles the letter F. So I guess F for fast because people skim a web page in a matter of seconds. As I said, uh, more to the point, this is a separate study, but. Um, um, web users spend 80% of their time above the page fold. So those two things um, in themselves are very significant. So 
I guess, in essence, the implications for us are to locate important elements at the top of the page fold and probably up the top left. Um, and users won't read text online um, thoroughly like they would offline, as I said. Um, they've got less tolerance online versus traditional media for text. Now, you might read a book offline. Um, I've never met a person who read a book um, on a computer screen or a mobile phone. A tablet, tablet device might be stretched. Um, you might be into that, depending, I guess, on the, on the font and the, and the resolution. Um, the, the study, I guess, you know, I guess in terms of implications, again, probably the first paragraph should state the important information, and then you know, headings, paragraphs, bullet points should carry the, you know, the, the really pertinent information and keywords. All right, so they're all things for us to consider in terms of how, how people read the web and, and use web pages and how we should design for effective online learning. All right, I'm going to wrap up there just, just before um, finish time. Um, if there's any questions or comments, feel free to drop them in the chat area or else stick your hand up and Ian will happily unmute your mic. I can see that. Yeah, in terms of the theme, uh, so the theme on the LMS, let me just have a quick look back there. Uh, IK that I was demonstrating, yeah, it's sort of an adaptation of a theme by the name of Aardvark for Moodle, um, if that helps. So it's a, it's a third party, third party theme. Sure. Yep. We did. What I was going to do, that's fine, I was going to drop it on our LMS uh, space, which is AISQ.net, and incidentally for, for everybody, that's where I'll be putting the, uh, I guess, the session presentations, uh, both, I guess, in PDF format and the uh, in the video. Um, but yeah, I'll drop it up there, Ian, and, and point a link at that for you so you can get it from there. Consider it done. Yep, sure.